Hello and welcome to my presentation, Advancements in Technology. Are perfusionists keeping up? I'm Joe Basha. In 1950, medical knowledge doubled every 50 years. By 1980, it was every seven years. By 2010, it was 3.5 years. And it is projected in, that in 2020, medical knowledge will double every 0.2 years, which is a mere 73 days. Are we as a profession keeping up? Can we keep up? If so, how are we keeping up? And how are our perfusion training programs and the youth of our profession going to face the challenges that this kind of doubling of knowledge is going to create? I'd like to take a brief tour, if you will, through memory lane, sort of to see where we're going, look at where we came from. And in the upper left-hand corner, we see uh, Dr. Dodrell overlooking his heart-lung machine. Back in those days, the if you wanted a heart-lung machine, you built it yourself. And many of these were collaborative efforts. The machine was said to look like a car motor. Not surprisingly, it was a collaborative effort with General Motors. On the right, top right, we see Dr. Mustard, very affable looking fellow, Canadian, was an orthopedic surgeon, got talked into being a cardiac surgeon, and his idea was to put monkey lungs in a flask and pump the blood through it, ventilate it, there's your oxygenator back into the patient. Then Dr. Lilyhigh, down below, the grandfather of cardiac surgery, uh, who advocated the use of cross circulation. Had the biggest headlamp I've ever seen, looks like a pretty intense fella, but the, the fact is these folks really did this. And I think it's safe to say that if Dr. Mustard had kind of come into the perfusion office or perfusion lounge one morning, that had one existed at the time, much less a perfusionist, and said, well, Joe, I think, I think today we're gonna put monkey lungs in a flask and that's gonna be our oxygenator. We're gonna pump through it, ventilate it, and back into the patient. We all would have had the same look on our face. But they really did do this stuff. This is the device that has the distinction of being the heart-lung machine first used successfully on a human. Um, it is the Gibbon IBM Heart Lung Machine Model 2 on display at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, it was for its time a very sophisticated device. In the upper uh, left hand side, top left, you can see the screens, the oxygenator screens. It had four DeBakey roller pumps. It had pH sensors, pressure monitors. It weighed 2,000 pounds. It had nitrogen bottles down below to risk uh, to reduce explosion risk. Uh, very sophisticated for its day. We're talking 1953. Uh, and speaking of DeBakey roller pumps, on the left side you see a replica of the original, the original DeBakey roller pump, patented by Michael DeBakey in 1921 as a medical student at Tulane University is in the Smithsonian Institute, Washington, DC. We can see how it works, you know, the stroke volume, it has a counter, and uh, you can calculate uh, how much uh, blood you've transfused or taken from someone or whatever the case may be. What's fascinating about it is that this thing, uh, which was patented by Dr. DeBakey in 1921 as a medical student, um, is the same DeBakey roller pump that is the foundation of every heart-lung machine we currently use today. Here's a punch card business machine. Many people said that the uh, original heart lung machine that you previously saw, in fact, I'll go back and show you again, resembled a punch card business machine. Again, a collaboration with IBM, not at all surprising. And here is uh, in the center picture, uh, Dr. Gibbon with his wife, Mary Gibbon and the uh, heart lung machine. On the right, uh, I don't know what case that's being used on, but it is clearly the uh, Gibbon IBM Model 2. And I don't know if that's Mary Gibbon, Gibbon or not running the pump there, but uh, it's interesting to see that there is a person who we now know as a perfusionist operating that device for this particular case. Uh, and uh, the first case that was done, again, May 6, 1953, Cecilia Bavalek, 
uh, she needed an ASD repair and she was alive and well on the 50th anniversary of that operation in May of 2003. I know she gave a talk at a presentation at, a, at one of the conferences. Um, but Dr. Gibbon, who worked the longest of anybody on this process of the heart lung machine, only did four cases. First patient died, second patient died, third patient, Cecilia, lived, fourth patient died. He never did another heart case with the use of the heart lung machine. I don't think he did another heart case. Turned it over to a colleague. I thought that was very interesting. Nevertheless, they needed someone to run this pump and they looked for industrious people uh, to, uh, to teach them how to do this. And in 1971, the first formal perfusion training program, Texas Heart Institute School of Perfusion Technology, was opened by its founder and leader, Charlie Reed. 1973 to 1975, Charlie was the first president of our, at the time, only professional society. Now there are two. And in 1975, he was the first president of the newly formed American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion. I am very proud to say that I graduated from the second THI, Tucson Heart Institute, met Charlie in 1978 when he came to interview me and review our school to see if we too could be accredited. So we were the second ABCP accredited school of perfusion in the country. And I graduated from that program in 1979. Qualities that were looked for were independent, fearless, great communicator, thick skin, mechanically inclined, intelligent, creative, industrious, innovative. Listen, it got rough back there. You couldn't have thin skin. And you were inventing a lot of this stuff, these circuits, how to make something work on the fly as the operation was actually going on. You needed to be durable. These cases lasted a long time. You needed to be inquisitive, adaptable, interested, quick thinker, but most of all, you needed to be a doer. Perfusionists have historically been known as doers. Some contemporary realities, cabbages and valves are still our bread and butter. However, caseloads have decreased tremendously in the past couple of decades, from high of 700,000 to under 200,000 today. But yet there are more perfusionists than ever, certified perfusionists, 4,135 in the country. We are embattled by TAVR. Will TAVR become the first line valve over open uh, aortic valve replacement? I don't know. I'm not here to debate that today. I don't think it will, but that's a separate topic, a separate talk for, uh, for uh, another time. But I think we need to plan for it being, we saw it with off-pump surgery, off-pump cabbage rose to as high as 30%. Now it's down below 11%. Uh, but I think we need to plan for that and consider it. And then what's going to happen with the mitral um, and a lot of other things where it's fine if they do it minimally invasive and they still need the heart lung machine. But when they start talking about not needing the pump or perfusionists anymore, I think we need to be listening to that and paying attention and figuring out how do we make this system better, sleeker, smaller, more minimally invasive, less traumatic and, uh, continue to be used and needed for a lot of these procedures that are being done. And to that, and I question whether we are not truly our own worst enemies. And we saw this happen with cardiac surgeons. Cardiac surgeons gave up anything diagnostic years ago to the cardiologists. So all of this stenting that's being done would have ordinarily been being done by the cardiac surgeon. Um, and, but it was because they were so busy doing heart surgery, they had no time to mess around with diagnosing cardiac disease. Here's a graph from the ABCP annual report, 4,135 perfusionists. You can see that it has increased each year uh, since about 2000. And this is sort of a cartoon of my view of some of today's perfusionists and even some that may not be, you know, maybe a little older. We've got our head in the sand. We're asking progress to tell us anything but the truth. 
progress tells us not to worry. Everything's going to be okay because it is because technology is not going to stop. It is going to continue to barrel down, eat us and continue to go if we don't get our heads out of the sand and confront these challenges head on. In 1979, when I finished my training, I could harvest vein open, of course, there was no such thing as EVH, put in radial arterial lines, first assisted, spent many a day holding coronary perfusers uh, and uh, for open aortic valve replacements because we didn't have cardioplegia. We, I pumped, pumped cases, case after case after case. We even monitored intraaortic balloon pumps. We were the only ones who could touch the intraaortic balloon pump at that time. 1982 heard about cell savers. That was all within the perfusionist purview. Nobody else would touch a cell saver. So a lot of cases, balloon pumps, ECMOs, VADs, auto transfusion, anything new. But we've been slowly but surely giving it all away. Auto transfusion nurses or auto transfusion technologists. We have our perfusion assistants, whatever you want to call them. ECMO going to respiratory therapists, nurses, uh, other kinds of uh, ECMO specialists. I've heard of those. Um, VADs, the same thing. So we're narrowing the things that we actually do and companies, instead of seeing us as the doers we used to be, are going to other people and not even bothering to bring these new technologies to us because a lot of them just don't even know who we are. And if they do, we're not embracing. We're not saying, oh, yes, we need to know about this and absorbing everything under our overall umbrella. Early 70s, there were about three to 400 heart centers. 1990 increased to about 850. Today, there are plus or minus 1,150. And this is an interesting graph. This is Medicare data only. You see hospitals climbing, the number of hospitals doing heart surgery. You see the number of procedures being done, steadily decreasing, those lines diverging. And you look over here, you see very uh, high volume uh, programs declining, very low volume programs increasing. And that just makes sense given the number of total number of hospitals doing heart surgery is on the rise but the number of cases are on the decline, well, it just makes sense that uh, there's going to be a lot of very low programs, very low volume programs, which adds challenges. Now it's good for us because it adds jobs, but how many people are in, you know, of our colleagues have we heard about are in a single perfusionist program on call 24 seven, can take no time off unless he can find somebody to cover for them, and can barely make enough cases to do the, to get their 40 cases required by the ABCP. So they're taking vacation time to go someplace to do per diem work to get cases, paying someone to cover them. And I think that's a paradigm that we're, uh, we're, we're looking at. You know, the American board has done well in including ECMO. I think I'll talk about that here a little further, but uh, we need to adopt other technologies that also are part of our overall case counting. I'm going to show you a couple of those that I think are really exciting and interesting. This is also a very interesting and instructive slide. The red line is the baseline cardiac surgeons looking at 20,005 to project it out to 2030. And we see that the number is steadily declining. The line here represents population over the age of 65. It is clearly going up and it is projected to go up astronomically. If you train 75 heart surgeons a year, this is what you're looking at giving just normal attrition. If you look at training 150 a year, you stay above the baseline CT surgeon uh, uh, number and loss, but just barely. It's not keeping up with growth. And these numbers are very important, 75 and 150. Just keep those in mind as I move forward with these slides. I stole these next couple of slides from Dr. Uh, Michael Mack up at Baylor in Dallas, and uh, he uh, 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 
He was one of our word recipients for the New Orleans conference a couple of years ago. Terrific guy, but I stole these slides from him. Uh, here's a cardiac surgeon. We'll operate for food. We could change that and say, we'll pump for food. That could be your, uh, your friendly uh, neighborhood perfusionist. And here's another cartoon slide of the Cardiac Surgeon Express uh, on the road to extinction. That could easily be the Perfusionist Express. Uh, you choose. And here is uh, Dr. Mike Mack. And he, he feels that the way for cardiac surgeons to survive the next uh, couple of decades is to uh, adopt and get really good at minimally invasive and robotic surgery. And again, I think that's probably very true. Uh, as long as they need the pump, it doesn't matter to us whether it's minimally invasive or robotic. We certainly got to be in the game because we want them to use the pump. Uh, but certainly there are other things we can be involved with. Again, I'm going to point those out uh, that uh, don't require us to be 100% tethered to our cardiac surgeon colleagues. You have to remember the cardiac surgeons are going to do surgery without the pump if they can. Uh, they're going to do thoracic cases, uh, lung cases that they may not need us, endovascular stenting where they really don't need us. Uh, I think we need to diversify as well. The connection between the cardiac surgeon and the perfusionist is always going to be one uh, that is very, very close uh, and needs to stay that way. But we also need to branch out ourselves. Perfusion training programs. I thought this was an interesting slide. You see that between 1984 and about 1994, 1995, there was a steady increase and then it slowly came back down. And uh, you see that it's been fairly steady over the past few years of the number of perfusion training programs. Uh, here we see the number of patients on the left-hand column there, or not number of patients, number of perfusion, uh, people admitted to perfusion training programs. 2001, it was 131, 2013, 159, and the number is sort of vacillated up and down, but it's fairly consistent. The lowest graduation rate I saw was 81.6%, uh, and the uh, lowest employment rate I saw was 88.7%. Currently, uh, in 2013, 97% of people who uh, graduated from perfusion school were employed. I think that's, a, that's, that's pretty good. That's hopeful. Uh, good number. This is the slide, however, that really caught my attention. Age less than 25. 40% in 2013, 59 of 139 graduates from perfusion school, over about 42% were 25 years of age or less, which means those folks can have a 30 year career and be 55 years of age or under. That is amazing. Are they going to have a profession for the next 30 years? They're the ones that really need to worry about it, but they're young, we're older. It's our job to help them be successful. It's our job to teach them how to help this profession that I've been in for 30, depending on how you do the math, 37 years um, that I love. Will it be around another 37 years for them? Or how many of them? Yeah, so I think that's something that we, uh, we all need to, uh, to take uh, into consideration and uh, also quite seriously. Some past board directors, people that I think deserve uh, to be mentioned. Some of them I've starred for a variety of reasons, but I want to talk specifically about uh, two of these people. Charlie Reed, I've already mentioned. He is the grandfather of perfusion. And Charlie was an interesting character, but he loved this profession. He made a mistake in trying to create an environment where perfusionists were equal stakeholders in the care and say of the cardiac surgery patient and went to war with the AATS. Ultimately, Charlie lost that war. Personally, I don't think it was a war Charlie should have waged. One, 
at the time and still currently, with few exception, we do not have the same uh, academic bona fides that you need to be a cardiac surgeon, nor the degree of training that a cardiac surgeon endures in order to uh, practice that field, to earn the right to practice in that field. Should we? Man, that's a question that's up for debate. Uh, but nevertheless, in at that, that time, it was, uh, 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 I think, misguided, though well-intended. Uh, Charlie will always have a special place in my heart and um, someone that I think all should know who he is. I'm somewhat disappointed that some perfusion students, in fact, some perfusion graduates, don't know who Charlie Reed is. Uh, we need to change that. There's some other names on here, uh, just very quickly, Jim Deering, uh, Jerry Dobbs. Jerry Dobbs interviewed me uh, for a website that he used to have. He used to do podcasts in the early 90s. Wonderful human being, sadly recently died over the past uh, several months ago of uh, cancer, survived by his lovely wife. He uh, uh, gave me the uh, Perfusion Education website that I'm going to uh, try and do some great things with uh, in, uh, in, his, uh, in his honor. Uh, Diane Clark uh, was the uh, co-author of the first textbook of Perfusion along with Charlie Reed, Aaron Hill, Earl Lawrence, Mark Cruz. Um, these were really great guys and some of them still very active today uh, in, uh, a, uh, in another professional uh, society, one of our professional societies. But nevertheless, we need to know who these people were. That We've got some real notable people in our profession who have done some really wonderful things with it. This is what some of our technology looked like uh, years ago. That's uh, in the lower right-hand corner and lower left-hand corner is a Shiley S100A bubble oxygenator. Uh, I used that after I was out of training for, uh, about a year and a half. And up above, we see the Travanol bag oxygenator. This is the actual oxygenator that I trained on uh, and compare that to the technologies that we have today. Just a remarkable difference. Look at the oxygenators uh, of today. Again, you know, I mean, what an exciting time to be in this uh, business. I think that manufacturing can do better than they're currently doing, uh, but uh, you know, there are concerns about where perfusion is going, and I think manufacturing is not putting the amount of resources into the development of new technologies for cardiopulmonary bypass uh, and perfusion that they uh, did many years ago in the early days uh, because they're uncertain about what is the future of our profession. This is a not untypical or atypical uh, operating room. We see the surgeon hard at work. We see, and he's focused here on his field, we see the nurse, uh, scrub nurse, ready to hand him instruments or whatever he may need, looking, watching, anticipating. We see the perfusionist laser focused over here. He's doing something, but I can assure you he knows exactly what the level is in this reservoir, what the pressure is and everything else that's going on. And so typical, there's anesthesia with their arms folded, folded, looking over, wondering, what the heck are they doing over there? But compare that operating room, which is not that uncommon today, to what operating rooms doing heart surgery looked like years ago. People came from all over the world. They stood on top of each other, on top of tables, on top of each other's shoulders. They, 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 it was like a mosh pit trying to get in there to get a glimpse at Dr. Cooley operating on a heart a human heart. Pretty incredible. So much winning if I get elected that you may get bored with winning. Believe me, I agree. You'll never get bored with winning. We never get bored. So oh, Donald, how can we win again? Well, there are a lot of new emerging technologies coming up for the perfusionist. VAD and ECMO has improved tremendously. They're doing VA ECMO in the emergency room for rescue therapy, 
uh, for patients with refractory lethal arrhythmia. Angiovac device, I'm going to show you a video of that, quite interesting. And you know that VA ECMO program in the uh, ER, uh, the emergency room doctors are learning how to put these cannulas in. We need to want to support them. And I do understand there's research resource utilization issues. I'm going to talk about that very briefly moving forward. But uh, just, just for now, I recognize that. But we need to be thinking about, look, this is something we can do. We need to do it. Because if we don't, somebody else will. Um, CRRT, they call it CRRT, but uh, I call it CVVH. We've been doing forms of CVVH for years. Um, but it's more than just for renal replacement therapy. I'll show you some of that. Therapeutic plasma exchange, cancer therapies, isolated limb perfusion, uh, intra-abdominal hyperthermia, full body hyperthermia, hypothermia for patients who have had stroke. Um, you know, does it make sense to uh, put these gel pads on and reduce the temperature for uh, which takes a long time and sometimes is uncontrollable, pouring for, or, 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 or submerging them in ice water where you can't control the cooling and then you have to take it away and it's very difficult, you're up and down, they're blowing fans on these people. Shouldn't we be doing it extracorporeally? It's a good question, it's debatable, uh, it's maybe controversial, but perfusionists can solve that problem if we, if we put our minds to it. Uh, VAT and ECMO historically, again, started off perfusion only. It's now nursing, respiratory tear, uh, respiratory care, I'm sorry, PBMTs uh, or perfusion assistant type people, ECMO specialists. I understand it's high resource utilization, but it is a revenue source. Remember, perfusionists in the traditional sense of cardiac surgery are nothing more than an expense. This is an opportunity for us to be a revenue generating resource. Questions remain as to whether it should be only perfusion responsibility, but it does count towards our ABCP case requirements, both for insertion and monitoring for a period of time and then eight hours of monitoring. I do applaud the ABCP for that. Um, ECMO is on the rise, increased 433% between 06 and uh, 2011. There's a graph showing that uh, increase. I think some of the reason for that is we've gotten better at it. Uh, the Avalon catheter single cannula technique has been huge in improving veno veno ECMO survival in patients with uh, ARDS. Um, there are still questions, however, you know, is there really a benefit to ECMO? I think some of the problem is that studies just simply haven't detected it uh, definitively yet because they're very difficult to do and uh, everybody does things a little bit differently, though that's getting better with ELSO. Uh, we aren't doing it right. We don't know how best to do it. Well, I think we are doing it right some, and I think we do know how best to do it. Uh, the question is, is everybody following those guidelines? Again, ELSO is working very hard on that. Which patients may benefit? Specific populations, timing of initiation. Look, earlier is better. There's always going to be the argument that you do it too early, and well, the patient probably really didn't need it. You wait too late, and well, you have a dead patient on ECMO. So, you know, I think early initiation, uh, and again, there are parameters and protocols to follow. Uh, technical issues, I think with the uh, Vino Vino and the Avalon catheter, huge, but you have to have people that know how to put that catheter in properly. You have to have the right imaging, um, and that does take some time. Uh, anticoagulation, flows, vent settings, fluid management. I think every patient on ECMO needs to be on CVVH. Uh, not only is it a, uh, a, a good opportunity for us to acquire another technology, it is also a very good revenue source for perfusion companies. Concurrent care, dosing of antibiotic, all of these things I think have uh, been worked out pretty well. And ECMO survival is really quite good in comparison to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, the angio back device, I'm going to show you a video here. Currently solely perfusion, that could change. Again, it all depends on us. It's on the very, it's in the very early stages of utilization. Really interesting device for the removal of unwanted intravascular material. And while you watch this video, I want you to watch where the perfusionist, the lines start to chatter. That's the engaging of the tip or of the funnel onto the clot that you're trying to remove 
uh, from the inferior vena cava. Uh, this procedure is a minimally invasive technique where we access the veins often in the neck, the two largest veins in your neck on the side, and we put a cannula down into the clot and we essentially vacuum out the clot in the IVC, which is the largest vein in your abdomen, which drains all the blood from your legs and your pelvis. Uh, once we unclog that vein, we then continue to remove the clot in the pelvis and then continue down in the legs until we've removed all the clot from the knees all the way to the heart. Most of the procedures are done with x-ray guidance, uh, meaning it's much like a video game where we're watching the uh, device on a screen as we're manipulating it with our hand, which goes through a very small uh, incision in the vessel. So this is the angiovac aspiration catheter, and this is the device that we put in the neck that actually aspirates the uh, clot from the veins. Uh, although it's very large, the, the vein in the neck is about twice this size. So uh, it's got an expandable tip that literally acts like a large cone on a vacuum that will reach down and uh, remove the clot directly. It then extends through a filter, uh, and then the blood is given back to the patient. So the procedure itself can take so anywhere this, from about two hours to three hours. Watch the line. Um, most, most of that is preparation. The actual the patient chatter? being under anesthesia is about half that time. That's engaging most the clock. Most of our patients have had incredible outcomes. We've had some patients that uh, hadn't walked in two months and had been sitting in other hospitals on blood thinners. And uh, three days after the procedure, we're doing physical therapy and have fully recovered. Real interesting technology. CVVH, continuous veno-veno hemofiltration. Again, we've been doing it on bypass for years, can be done in the ICU. Uh, it's uh, an excellent tool for maintaining uh, homeostasis uh, with the added benefit of removing inflammatory mediators uh, and pro-inflammatory mediators. It is an adjunct therapy to ECMO. As far as I'm concerned, every patient on ECMO or VAD therapy should also be on uh, the uh, this acute should be on CVVH. Uh, it is a highly complex five pump system. Uh, it has some are capable of multi multiple therapeutic modalities. Like some machines can do CVVH, CVVHD, CVVHDF, therapeutic plasma exchange, and MARS, which is a molecular adsorption recirculation system. I'm going to show you an example of that. Normally monitored by the RNs because. The folks that make this stuff don't even know what perfusionists are. And they go directly to the nurses. But the nurses are pushing back because they're really busy and they feel this is a really complex device and they're not 100% comfortable with it. There are opportunities there for us, both in terms of being involved in the care of patients in the ICU, which leads to other things as well and as a revenue generating source for uh, our profession, our colleagues. Uh, troubleshooting setup initiation are historical problems on uh, for ICU uh, intensive care medicine doctors, getting the device set up and going and then dealing with it when they have problems. A lot of pressure flow relationships and if you're not familiar with it, like we are, it's what we do every day, you have uh, some problems. So let's take a look at this. This is an example of CVVH being done in conjunction with a plasma adsorption uh, therapy, also known as MARS. Uh, so in CVVH, you're taking the plasma water, ultrafiltrating it, and replacing it with what you want the plasma water to look like. Now clearly this video was taken uh, outside of the country. We see the foreign language and they don't have HIPAA regulations there. Um, And this was on the web. I downloaded this video off of the internet. Pretty good looking uh, 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 ICU monitor system. And there is the other device and it's going to show you 
the Mars system where you are removing not just plasma water, but plasma, removing it from the uh, blood, treating that plasma, removing the toxins, and then replacing the plasma with the red cells, returning it to the patient. And you're gonna see that right here. Here it is. So this is the Mars system. Again, a lot going on there. And for an ICU nurse, with a patient that's on ECMO and on, you know, four or five different pressers and drips, it can get pretty intense, who may also be bleeding because they're coagulopathic. They need some help. We can fill that void. Other opportunities, transplants, heart, liver, lung, CHF therapies, treating congestive heart failure, patients in pulmonary edema in the, uh, in the uh, both in the ICU and the emergency department, cancer therapies, isolated limb, liver, peritoneal, full body, uh, even uh, doing some innovative stuff ourselves. I wrote this article uh, on uh, minimally invasive uh, technique instead of cross clamping the aorta, uh, but stopping the heart. Uh, it never really gained popularity. A couple of others uh, papers were written after this one, but you know this is an example. I think that. Uh, there's a lot of really smart perfusionists out there and I think we can come up with different ways, for example, of making minimally invasive uh, easier for the surgeons that include us versus excluding us. So where are the sticking points? Well, there's our own interests, leadership, uh, which uh, I don't know who is ever going to be the next Charlie Reed, but our profession really does need somebody. Uh, for example, cardiac surgeons lobbied very aggressively and I, my hat's off to them so that if y you want to be paid to do TAVR, you not only have to have a cardiologist, you have to have a cardiac surgeon, both involved in the case. Now the cardiologists can do it by themselves, but CMS won't pay for it unless there's also a cardiac surgeon. We need some, we need an organization. We simply don't have it. And I don't mean to, uh, uh, I'll just leave it to say that I think that we need to do a better job of our professional organizations do a better job at protecting the interests of the rank and file perfusionists. We are also not without our own fault. We are an expense, not a revenue source for the hospitals, as I mentioned. Some of us have the philosophy of out by noon with no balloon. It's a job versus a profession. And we push back when we get asked to do other things. We need to fix those. Should we change the educational requirements? Should we be physicians? Should we require a minimum of a master's level? Should we, right now it's bachelor's. Should we require a uh, PhD? I, I don't know the answers to those questions, but they are things we probably should discuss. But we can be a part of the revolution or we can become extinct. Now, my question to all of you out there in internet land, does anybody know who this fine looking young man is. Well, he's my alter ego. I'd like to leave you with a little bit of inspiration. Jr. is laced into an elaborate pressure suit in preparation for a daring ascent into the stratosphere. Kittinger, who weighs 150 pounds, packs 155 pounds of suit and equipment. The scientific goals of Kittinger's ascent are to test a new six-foot stabilizer parachute designed to keep an ultra-high altitude jumper from spinning and blacking out 
before he can open the main chute, the balloon reaches a height of 19 and a half miles.
Couldn't have done better himself. That's just inspiration. Inspiration there. And as I said, my alter ego. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope that you enjoyed it. And I hope that you take away some good, positive messages from it. Also hope to see you all in New Orleans. Thank you very much.